Open your Bibles to the book of Job this morning. Job chapter 1. What I want to do this morning is I want to preach on dealing with hardship. And I'm going to take this from the lesson that we see in Job 1 and 2. So what I'm going to do, Lord willing, is we're just going to step through Job 1 and 2 verse by verse. And we're going to learn how to deal with hardship by seeing how Job dealt with it. Let's pray quickly. Father, I pray that you'd open up our hearts. Lord, allow us to be admonished, to be edified um, by this story of what happened to the great patriarch Job. And Lord, help us to learn from that. And Lord, let us learn to apply these things in our own lives. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Job 1 in verse 1 it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So we see here that Job was a good man, right? It says he was a perfect man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. To eschew means to avoid or to shun. And we're told that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's the kind of man that Job was. So when we go through this story about Job, keep this in mind that Job was a good man. There was nothing that anybody could lay to Job's charge. God himself later on says that Job is a perfect and an upright man. This man had praise of God. So remember that as we go through and we see the things that happened to Job and remember that this is not happening to an evil man. This is not happening to a man who's under God's judgment. This is happening to a good man. Remember that. Verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons... And three daughters. We see already the blessing of God in this man's life. If you turn to Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, we see here that one of the blessings of God is to give a man many children. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not speak, or they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Job had a quiver full, a whole ten of them. He was clearly blessed of the Lord. And part of Job's blessing is going to end up being his test and his trial, as we see. Verse 3. His substance also is 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. So not only is he a good man that fears God and eschews evil, a perfect man, not only has God blessed him with a bunch of children, but he's also made him rich. This guy was the wealthiest man around, the wealthiest man in the East. He had 11,500 animals. That's a lot of animals. That's a lot of wealth. In those days, especially in an agrarian society, that would be the measure of a man's wealth, how many cattle he had, how many animals he had. So here's a man that is rich. God has clearly blessed him. Now, this is going to seem strange once we go through and we see what happens to Job and we think about, wait a minute, this isn't supposed to happen to good people, to people that the Lord's blessed with a wonderful family, to people that the Lord is blessed with wealth. This isn't supposed to happen to people like this. Verse 4 says, And his his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Isn't this what sometimes happens? you got good people that work really hard and they become wealthy and then they have kids and the kids don't exactly follow in their footsteps, right? Job's out there obviously working really hard to acquire over 10,000 head of stock, head of you know, stock, flock, whatever. And his sons are feasting in their houses and inviting their sisters to come over and have a party. In verse 5, And it was so. When the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. What a good man. 
he's concerned. He doesn't know for sure, but maybe my sons have cursed God in their hearts. Maybe they're out there getting drunk or something. So he's concerned about his children. It says to train up a child in the way that he should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. And Job is concerned here. I'm sure a lot of parents with adult children sometimes that go off in their own way, sometimes they probably stay at home and pray for those children to come back. I hear an uh, amen from Wayne and Judy. <laughs> and no, but seriously though, a lot of people do deal with that. And it's, it's a hardship and you have to cling to that proverb, train up a child in the way that he should go and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Because sometimes they do depart for a season, just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son's father, he seemed like a good father, right? He was a wealthy man, gave him his inheritance. He went out and squandered it with riotous living. And then when he finally learned the lesson God had for him, he came back. He, when he was old, he departed not from it. So Job here is praying for his sons. In verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now these sons of God here are actually speaking of angels. In the New Testament, when we refer to, when we read of sons of God, we're talking about children of God who are Christians, people who have been regenerated. But in the Old Testament here, the word, the phrase sons of God is only used just a few times. It's used a couple times, about three times, I think, in the book of Job, and one time back there in Genesis 6, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. But if you look in the book of Job, in verse, or chapter 38, this tells us that the sons of God here are speaking to the angels. Job 38 and verse 7. I don't think that's the word. Oh, that's Psalm 38. That didn't look right. Job 38. Let's see if I can get the right book. Job 38 and verse 7. It says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Let's, let's back up to verse 6 so we get the context. Wherefore, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, of the earth, God's talking about here. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You see, God here is challenging Job. He's saying, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I created this place? When God created the earth, it says there, when he laid the foundations of the, of the earth, the angels, this, the morning stars, the sons of God, just different terms for the angels, they shouted for joy. They were watching God create. So that tells me that God created the angels probably on day one before he created the earth. Because the angels saw the Lord laying the foundations of the earth and they shouted for joy and they rejoiced in that. Clearly, the sons of God here cannot be speaking of humans. There were no humans when God laid the foundations of the earth. This is what is being referenced here in Job 1 and verse 6. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. You see, at this time, this is before, this is after Satan and a third of the angels had been cast out of heaven, but before they had been cast down into the earth and been locked down into the earth where they couldn't go out of the earth. And Satan still had access up into heaven to accuse the saints. That's what Satan's name means. He's the accuser of the brethren. And we'll see that here in the next verse. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect man and an upright, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now in verse 1, we're told here by the author, probably Elihu or whoever, I think it was Elihu who wrote the book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Job was an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. But now in verse 8, it's God himself is saying that Job there's none like him, a perfect man, an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil. Job is being praised by God himself. 
Now you know we talk, we're talking about a good man when God himself praises this man. You see, Job was an Israelite indeed, a Jew indeed, even though Job, Job preceded the Jews. The Jews didn't come around until, well, Israel came around and Jew comes from Judah, right? So this was many, many years later that the Jews, even Abraham, I, I think Job probably either preceded Abraham or he was around the same time as Abraham. The book of Job was likely the, old, the first book of the Bible written um, as far as when it was written. The chronology of the book of Genesis would have preceded the events of Job, but Genesis would have actually been written down after Job. Job was the oldest book written. So anyway, my point is that Job, there were no Jews when Job was written, but Job spiritually, just like we are, was a spiritual Jew. If you look in Romans 2 and verse 29, we see here the characteristic of the true Jew is that his praise is of God and not of men. Romans 2, verses 29 and 30. It says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. The true Jew doesn't have an outward circumcision, but an inward circumcision. The true Jew is a Jew in heart and in spirit. The true Jew is praised of God and not men. You see, the false Jew, the natural only Jew, is praised of men, at least other Jewish men, and they tout themselves and they they really think they're special. Paul was one of them circumcised the eighth day, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, the Hebrew, touching the law, Pharisee, and blameless, and so on. So they were praised of men, but the true Jew is not praised of men, he's praised of God. And that's what we all want to strive for in our lives, to be praised of God. Don't worry about if men praise you or not. As a matter of fact, if men praise you, you better be worried, because men tend to praise people who are not godly. And we're told in the book of Proverbs that the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And that is the state of our country. The wicked are walking on every side. I, w- I would tell you where it is, but I don't remember. It's in the Proverbs there anyway. They're walking on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And look at what we see in the movies and in the media. The vilest men, the nastiest people are exalted. And that is an indication that the wicked walk on every side. But the true Jew is the one that's praised of God. Jesus said that, um, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. Right? Look at Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter, might be chapter 6. Or it might not be. It is Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the, to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them which persecute you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. I thought that there was more. I must be thinking of another account anyway. But woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. But bless you whenever God speaks well of you. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 18. Let's uh, let's start back in verse 12, and we'll get the contrast here of people that are that are uh, spoken well of of men and compared against other men, and then we'll see what's really important. Verse 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You see, it's not wise to compare ourselves among ourselves, to look at somebody else and say, well, I'm better than he is, I'm better than she is, or to look at two other people and say, well, he's a lot better Christian than he is. It's not wise to do that. It's fine to recognize good qualities in people, that's okay, but we don't want to compare ourselves and say, well, I'm not a good Christian because I don't have the same gifts as this brother or this sister does. Every one of us is made differently. Some of us have the ability to speak publicly. Some of us don't. Some of us are good public prayers. Some of us 
kind of stumble through it, right? But that doesn't mean that one of us is a better Christian than the other. It just means that some of us are given different gifts. Some people are good at teaching. Some people are good at admonishing. Some people are good at helping out. People have different gifts. And that just means we're all different, not that one of us is better than the other. But look in verse 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. If God commends you, you're approved. But if men commend you, well, you may be approved or you may not be approved because generally men tend to commend the wrong people anyway. So let's turn back to the book of Job again. Job 1. So the Lord has just testified what a good man Job is there in verse 8. Notice what the Lord says there. Hast thou considered my servant Job? The Lord was proud of Job. He looks, you know, he asks Satan, what are you doing? All walking up to and fro in the earth trying to cause trouble. And he says, well, have you ever considered my servant Job? Look at this guy. He's a good guy. And Satan says in verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? God, you think he's just fearing you for nothing? I mean, do you, you really think there's not in, something in this for him? Of course, if there's nothing in it for him, you think he'd be fearing you? He wouldn't care about you. You've just done so much for him and given him so much stuff. Of course he's going to fear you. Why wouldn't he? Verse 10. Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Well, of course he's going to bless you. Of course he's going to fear you, right? You've hedged him about. You've protected him. No, nothing bad's ever happened to this guy. Protected his house. You blessed the work of his hands. He's the richest guy. His substance is increased. He's got 11,500 animals, for goodness sakes. Of course he's going to fear you. He's going to be a perfect man. Why wouldn't you be if you had all that? I mean, anybody, if you didn't, you'd be crazy. You'd maybe be afraid God would take it away from you or something. Of course he's going to fear you. Now listen to the, the devil reason with God here. Verse 11. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now the devil's made a challenge to God. Take everything that Job has away from him, and then see if he'll fear thee. He'll curse thee to thy face, Satan thinks. Verse 12. You see, Satan, before we go there, Satan, this is typical of the devil. He's called the accuser of the brethren. Turn with me to Revelation 12 and verse 10. This is what Satan does. He accuses us. You ever sin? And then you have this nagging thought in the back of your head. If you, Children of God don't think like that. Children of God don't do those kind of things. You're probably not even a, you're probably not even a saved person. You probably are going to hell. If you were a child of God, you wouldn't act like that. That's the accuser. That's the devil. Revelation 12 and verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That's exactly what Job is recording here. Satan accused the brethren day and night. He had access up to the throne of God to accuse the brethren until he was cast down out into the earth and not allowed to go into the heavenlies anymore. He's the accuser. Isn't that what he did to our Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that exactly what he did? When Jesus, after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and he was tempted of the devil. And what did the devil say? If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. If thou be the Son of God, make these stones bread. If thou be the Son of God. I don't remember the third one. But anyway, it was, it, he kept saying it. He was calling in question whether or not Jesus was the Son of God. And he does the same thing to us. Now, we are not the Son of God. We are a Son of God. But it's the same thing. If thou be the Son of God, he does the same thing to us. If thou be a son of God, you really think you're a child of God and you act like that? So anytime that you have those doubts, just remember where they're coming from and do like Michael the archangel did and say, the Lord rebuke thee. Resist them with the word of God. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you, Peter tells us. 
And isn't that exactly how Jesus did it? Every time when, when Satan came after Jesus, what did Jesus do? He didn't give him man's wisdom. He didn't give him philosophy. He didn't try to take him on head to head. He said, it is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Every time Jesus came back and he had an answer from the scripture. So when you have those temptations of the devil and he's accusing you, you go back and you give him the scripture. Whoso believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Get thee behind me, Satan. I am a son of God. I am a child of God. I know I am because the Bible says so. Back to Job. Job 1 and verse 12. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So the Lord actually gives Satan power over Job, but he puts a restriction on it. As the rivers of water, uh, um, how's it go? Proverbs 21. I didn't. If you start it off wrong, then you may as well just forget it. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. King's heart is in the hand of the Lord. I think that's how it starts. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. you got lots of verses that show us that God is ultimately in control and God sets limits and boundaries on what we can do and on what the devil can do. The devil can only tempt you as far as the Lord will allow him. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 the Lord will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able. He will not allow the devil to completely destroy you. Because if he would, none of us would be here right now. You ever think about that? We have a true church. I have the office of a true minister. And if that's the case, wouldn't you think that Satan could probably figure that out? My goodness, he can surf the internet like we can. He can probably find true churches if by no other means. He can certainly know where true churches are. And he would most definitely have stamped this thing out already in its infancy. He could have destroyed me eons, eons ago, three years ago, whatever, <laughs> as, long as, as soon as I came into the ministry. I mean, it would take nothing to destroy me. It would take nothing to destroy any of you. It's only because God is restraining him that he doesn't do those things, just like it was with Job. He says, all right, go ahead, but don't touch his person, God said. Sometimes the Lord allows evil spirits to go out and to uh, tempt people or to punish people. You remember that happened back there in 1 Kings 22? Whenever King Ahab, I think it was, wanted to go off to war with King Jehoshaphat, they had a, a league together. They wanted to, I forget who they were going to go fight. But anyway, um, Ramoth Gilead. They wanted to go up against Ramoth Gilead, and they call all the prophets. You probably remember the story. And all the prophets say, oh, the Lord delivered them into your hand. Go and... Go take him. And, and Jehoshaphat's a little wiser than Ahab. And Jehoshaphat says, well, isn't there a, is there a prophet of the Lord? He's like, well, yeah, there's this one guy, Micaiah, but I hate him because he always prophesies against me. So they bring out Micaiah and the other prophets when they're on the way to bring him up there, or whoever went and got him. And he says, now, just say what the other prophets said. You know, don't go against the crowd. You've got 450 of these guys that are all saying to go ahead. You don't want to be the, the black sheep here. Just tell them what they want to hear. He says, okay, I'll tell them whatever the Lord says. And they say, should we go up to war against Ramoth Gilead? And Micaiah says, go and prosper. The Lord shall deliver him into thy hand. Ahab realizes he's being sarcastic with me. <laughs> he's not giving me a true answer. And he gets upset about that. See, didn't I tell you? And he, wouldn't, he, or he, he says, just speak nothing to me but what the word of the Lord is. So then he tells him, I saw all Israel as a sheep upon a hill with no shepherd. He says, let him go back. And Ahab says, see, he always prophesies evil against me. I told you. So anyway, they add, so then there's a little commentary given about what just happened there. And what happened was that the Lord said, who's going to go deceive Ahab to go up against Ramoth Gilead? And there was this evil spirit that came before the Lord. And he says, I'll do it. 
And the Lord says, well, wherewith? How are you going to do it? And he says, well, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And that's exactly what happened. Why did those 450 knuckleheads tell him to go up against Ramoth Gilead? Because a lying spirit went in the mouth of all those prophets. The Lord allowed a lying spirit to go and to give Ahab what he already wanted to have. Ahab wanted to do it. God gave him a revelation to accommodate that. So God can allow evil spirits. That's kind of a long story to to show the point. God can allow evil spirits to go and to either tempt people or to cause people to err who deserve to err because their heart's not right. In this case, Job didn't deserve it, but God had a test for Job, and he allows Satan to go out. Verse 13, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Do you realize that Job, at this moment, he had no idea what had just transpired in heaven? He didn't know that Satan went up to the Lord and was accusing Job. He didn't know that the Lord said, hey, he's in your hand. Go, you can take everything from him, but don't touch his life. He didn't know any of this happened. Job's just going along his merry way. He's a good man. He fears God. He eschews evil. A perfect man. He's praying for his kids. He's a judge in the land. He's a wonderful guy. And all of a sudden, something horrible happens. But Job doesn't have any idea what's going on. He doesn't know that God is allowing this to happen as a test. He doesn't know that. Have any of you been through something like this? You're just going along. Life's just great. You get pregnant. You're looking forward to having a baby. And then one day, you find out you had a miscarriage. That's hard. That's what Job felt like. Then you get pregnant again. You're looking forward to having a baby, right? And then one day you find out the baby's sick. The baby's got trouble, right? That's what Job felt like. He didn't do anything to deserve it. God just allowed it to happen to him as a test. You're going along one day and all of a sudden you find out you got cancer. That's tough, right? That... I'm sure that's a shocker. Just going along your merry way, just all of a sudden, wow, I've got cancer. Or you find out your lungs are shot and you've got to have a double lung transplant. Just turns your world upside down. This is what Job felt like. This is what he felt like. Verse 14, And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell on them. A lot of times, the first thing that God will tempt us with is our finances. I'm sure we've all been through that. At one point in our lives, we've all had money troubles, especially when you're younger, you don't have very much, and that's whenever you need it all because you've got, young, you got a young family. God will tempt you with money troubles. This is what he did to Job. You got the oxen and the asses out there plowing and the Sabaeans fall on them. Job had a thousand oxen. He said he had 500 yoke. A yoke is two oxen, right? A pair of oxen. So he had a thousand oxen. He had 500 she-asses. That's 1,500 of his animals. That is 13% of Job's net worth. 13% of his net worth evaporated in an instant. He didn't do anything wrong. It just happened to him. Just like the fish are caught in an evil net, we're told in Ecclesiastes. It just happened to him. Lost 13%, just like that. You, I'm sure a lot of you have lived a while. You've lived through the stock market crashes and things like that. You'll be going along on your merry way. People are, some people are ready to retire, and Bam! of your net assets are gone. A 
Well, I imagine Job thought, being the good man that he was, well, at least I've still got the sheep. I've still got the camels. You know, I'm still doing all right. I've only lost 13%. Verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And oh, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. He's just being barraged just over and over again. It just doesn't end. You'd think that once God gave you one severe test, that that would be it. The first test, and you pass that test, and that'd be okay. Because Job hasn't, he didn't curse God, right? He lost 13%. He lost all of the oxen and all of the asses, and he's still maintaining his integrity. You'd think, okay, God's, he's done now. But no, this time it's even worse than before. The first test was bad, but the second test is even worse. This time he loses 7,000 sheep. That's 61% of Job's assets. Now he's lost three quarters of all of his wealth. He's lost 74% of everything that he owns. But he still doesn't curse God. He still doesn't speak against God. And he's thinking, okay, I was pretty wealthy. I can deal 25%. I can, I'll, I'll still be okay. And I can still provide for my family with 25%, 26%. I'll be all right. I've still got the camels. That's, I'll be all right. Verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. As if it wasn't bad enough. Twice now this has happened. And now all that Job has left, it's taken away from him too. He's lost the camels. He's lost the remaining 26% of his wealth. Now he's got nothing. All of his herds, all of his flocks are gone. Not to mention all of his servants. You know, every time, whenever the, the flocks were destroyed, the servants were slain too. All of his help. Everything's gone. I preached last week on dealing with abundance. And I, I want to make sure you guys hear that one because I know you'll probably hear Jason's sermon next week. So, um, because you're hearing mine this week. So anyway, make sure you hear that one. I think you'll, um, you'll benefit from that as well. And I talked in that one about how riches certainly make themselves wings and they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Who would have thought when you got 11,000 cattle that in one day they're all going to be gone? But they do. They make themselves wings. So we don't ever want to trust in those things. Well, Job, being the good man that he was, could think, well, it's just stuff, right? Who cares? My whole portfolio is gone. All my cattle are gone. All my wealth, all my investments, everything's gone. But you know what? I I started out in this thing blind and naked. No, not blind, but anyway, poor and naked. I'm just, I'm poor and naked again. Okay, I'll be all right. At least I've got my family, though. You know, I can, I can go on. I've got the family still. I've still got my kids. I've still got my wife. I've lost all my stuff, but who cares? It's just stuff. I can get it back again. Verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now things get cranked up. It's one thing to lose all of your possessions. It's one thing to lose all that you've worked for all your life. But it's another thing to lose all of your children. It's hard enough to lose a child. I can't imagine what that's got to feel like. But imagine losing all of them. That'd be horrible. Job's thinking, what have I done? What in the world have I done? 
We're told in Psalm 34 and verse 19 that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Job 34, let's start with verse 17. It says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are, that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. If this doesn't describe Job, I don't know what does. Many are the afflictions. He's being barraged. This is the fourth major temptation and trial that he's gone through. And it keeps getting worse and worse. He keeps losing more and more. And now he's lost his own family. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But as the rest of the book of Job will show us, the Lord delivereth them out of them all. The Lord will deliver you through whatever trial and affliction you are facing. He will deliver you out of it, one way or the other. He will give you the grace to get through it. Look at Job 14 and verse 1. This is Job's description of what life is like. He says, Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. That's just life. And the longer you, you live, you just realize that it just seems like, now it just seems like I just get bad news about something, somebody all the time. You know, because the older you get, I mean, my grandparents are getting older, my aunts and uncles are getting older, my parents are getting older, and all of your families are getting older. I mean, it's just always, it seems like it's just something. And I only pastor two little churches. Imagine what somebody that has a hundred people, like Pastor Mott or something, imagine all the stuff that he gets hit with constantly. Man's days are few and full of trouble. Look at Ecclesiastes 2. Well, first of all, actually, let's go back to, go to Job 5 and verse 7. It says, yet, is, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Just as surely as the sparks fly upward because they're lighter than air, man is born unto trouble. That's just how it happens. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 23. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 23. So when something like this happens to you, don't think it's strange. Isn't that what Peter said? Peter said whenever, let me just hold your finger in Ecclesiastes 2, but while I have the thought, turn with me to, to 1 Peter. I think it's 1 Peter 4. Whenever an affliction happens, whenever a hardship happens to you, don't just think that some strange thing has happened to you. Because that's just, that's just what happens in the Christian life. God allows these things to prove us and to make us better. This is 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. When you go through these hard, intense, fiery trials, the Lord is doing it so that you can experience, that you can be a, partakers of, a partaker of his sufferings. You can draw closer to Jesus in your sufferings. You can feel a little bit of what Jesus felt. And when you do that, you can become a lot closer to Jesus. If you've been through something that somebody else has been through, that draws you together. You feel a kinship with that person. Well, when you've suffered in this life, that draws you closer to Christ who suffered for you. And when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. Like Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 16, I think it is, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. But back to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 23. It says, For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. Anybody know what that's like, not being able to take rest in the night? You got pain that's keeping you up? 
just part of the afflictions of being a human being. But it's not going to last forever. Jacob, the old patriarch, he said that few and evil had his days been. Genesis 47 and verse 9. Genesis 47 and verse 9. So much for the golden years, huh? This is what Jacob, this is what he had to say about his golden years. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and I have, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Few and evil. So Job loses his kids. And then it says in verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down <coughs> upon the ground and worshipped. I want you to notice one thing before we get to the best part of that verse. But it says, Then Job arose. You know, some things, when you hear really bad news, they say, you better take a seat. You ever feel like that? You ever get really bad news and literally you feel like you're going to pass out and you got to sit down? This is why it says Job arose. He had to sit down. You couldn't take all this stuff standing up. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, tore his clothes, shaved his head, and fell upon the ground, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Ask yourself, what would you do if you just found out that your entire wealth, all your possessions, had just evaporated into thin air? You lost everything you'd worked your whole life for, and then you lost all your kids. Are you going to fall down and worship? Or are you going to fall down and beat the ground and curse God and say, why? Why did this happen to me? This isn't right. That's not what Job did. Job fell down and worshipped. You know, we're supposed to give thanks in everything. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. Lesser men would have cursed God. Lesser men would not have worshipped. But remember, Job was a good man. And Job still doesn't know why any of this happened. He still doesn't know. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, even when you lose all your possessions, even when you lose your children, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Because God brings the good times and the bad times. Look at Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 14. It's easy to give thanks in the good times. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we forget to give thanks in the good times. We just continue on. Remember the the ten blind men that Jesus healed? And after he healed them, I mean, these guys have been blind for, I don't know, their whole lives or a long time. Jesus heals them, and nine of them just keep walking, don't even bother to go back and thank the guy that healed them. One of them. I don't know, was he a Samaritan? I forget anyway. He was a, some kind of a stranger anyway. One of them went back and thanked God. And Jesus says, where are the rest? We forget to thank God when times are good. And then when times are bad, usually we don't thank Him. We question Him. We complain. We want to know why things aren't going the way we think they should. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 14, it says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. That's pretty easy to do. But in the day of adversity, consider, God also hath set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. When the day of adversity comes, remember, God has set the day of prosperity over against the day of adversity. God has put both of these things into your life. He is the author of the adversity and the prosperity. And be thankful for both of them because he does them for a reason. You'll learn a lot more from adversity than you'll learn from prosperity. Ultimately, God is doing you good by the, pro- by the adversity that you go through. You ever see a kid 
grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth, never had any trouble, never had to, parents never had to worry about where the next meal was coming from or just anything that his heart could wish. Does a kid like that normally grow up to be a good, God-fearing, respectable citizen? No way. A lot of times it's the kids that grow up with the hardship and they're the ones that have to learn how to be thankful. They're the ones that learn how to work. Ultimately, the hardship they go through ends up making them a better person in the long run. It's hard to see it at the time, but always remember that when you're going through hardship that the Lord is actually smiling down upon you. It doesn't seem like it, but He is. He's doing it to make you a better person. That reminds me of a verse back in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. In verse 16, talking about what God did for Israel in the wilderness, He said, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. God allowed him to go through that wilderness and fed him with manna. They didn't exactly have what normal people had to eat. And he did that, though, for a purpose, to humble them, to prove them, and ultimately to do them good at thy latter end. God always has a purpose in what he allows us to suffer. Look at Job 13 and verse 15. We're supposed to give thanks in all situations. And look at Job. This is after Job has lost everything and then his friends, which I put in air quotes, his friends come and try to comfort him by blaming everything on him and saying that he was evil and that God had judged him for his wickedness. And Job says in verse, 13, verse 15 of chapter 13, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my way, mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Remember that verse when you're going through hardship. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. God did slay all of his beasts. He slew his family members. And he's about ready to slay Job's health. And despite all that, God says, or Job says, I'll still trust in him. Even if he slays me, I'll trust in him. Verse 21, Job 1, 21. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. I came into this world naked. I'm apparently going to go out of this world naked with nothing. He says, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, it's real easy to say, The Lord gave, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's easy. Everybody blesses. Well, some people bless. Some people don't even bless God's name when he gives. But good people bless God's name when he gives them something. But how many of us bless the name of the Lord when he takes away? That's pretty hard to do. How many of us, whenever we find out that we got the pink slip at work, we just lost our job, and we say, Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I just, now I'm going to experience adversity and privation and hardship. Most of us don't do that. But it's the Lord's prerogative. He can give and he can take away. You didn't deserve any of it anyway. So if he takes it away, he didn't take away from you anything that you deserved, right? The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job had a lot better attitude than Naomi did. You remember Naomi and Ruth back in Ruth chapter 1? There's a famine in Israel. Naomi and her husband, forget his name, they go off into the land of Moab, take their two sons with them. The two sons marry some girls in Moab. And then the husband up and dies. And then after that, the girls' husbands up and die. And now Naomi's left with no husband, no sons-in-laws, and a couple of daughter-in-laws that are left not provided for. 
in verse 20 and 21, And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. This is after she goes back to Israel. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Or no, this is right before she went back. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home empty, again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Naomi means pleasant, and Mara means bitter. It's like, don't call me pleasant. I'm not pleasant. Look at what the Lord's done to me. He's afflicted me. I went out full. I came back empty. This is Naomi's attitude. She didn't have a very good attitude. She's bitter with the Lord. Job lost way more than Naomi did, and Job still says, The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22, Job 1, 22. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He did not sin, and he did not charge God foolishly. He never spoke back to God. He never condemned God for what God allowed to happen to him. There's a pastor at the pastor's conference this year. He preached a sermon on very similar to this, only he was really dealing with hardship in the ministry. And he went through, he, he used a lot of Job 1 and 2, and kind of gave me the idea for this sermon. I wanted to preach on it eventually, and I was going to preach on something else when I came down here. I had a, a two-part um, sermon series that I put together a while back that I've been waiting to preach, and I was going to do that here. And then I just knew about all the hardship that people are going through down here, and I thought that this would be a lot more... Um, a lot more beneficial for you. So a lot of some of these these thoughts I've gotten from this man. His name was Stephen Polly, and he had a quote there which I thought was great. And I don't remember if he was quoting somebody else or he came up with this with it on his own. But he said, "Failure doesn't define a man. What a man does with failure defines the man." You think about that. A failure defined a man. Most of the very successful entrepreneurs out there would still be failures. That would define them. But it's what you do with failure. Because when you take failure and you learn from it and you move on from it, that defines you. That shows what kind of a man you are. Verse chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So, we don't know how long after this was, but Job has already lost all of his possessions. He's lost all of his kids. And then Satan comes back. See, Satan has lost the bet, right? Satan said, how, oh, just take everything from him, you know, curse thee that I face. But Job didn't curse God. He didn't charge God foolishly. So now Satan comes back for another round. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil? And he still holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. God is pretty proud of Job, isn't he? Because Satan said, hey, take all this stuff away, no curse thee to thy face. And God says, all right, I know Job, I think he's a good guy, go ahead and do it. And he takes it all away, and Job passes the test, and God is vindicated. Now Satan comes back for round two, and the Lord says, hey, look at my servant Job, still perfect, still upright, still fears God, even though you've destroyed him without cause. Verse four, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Satan says, well, sure. I mean, all you've really taken from him is just things external to himself. But take his health from him and then see what he does. It's pretty easy when you're still in pristine health to be praising the Lord. Verse 5. But put forth now, or but put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. 
once again, God sets a restriction on it. He allows Satan to go and to touch Job's flesh, to afflict his body. You know how many billions of dollars a year are spent on people trying to get their bodies feeling well? Nobody likes to be in pain, right? Most men will give a lot to get out of pain. Satan knows this. So he says, just touch his flesh. He'll curse you to your face. Verse 7. So when Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with Or so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. The crown's the top of your head. Satan smote him with boils from the sole, the bottom of his feet, to the top of his head. You realize if you had boils on your body like that, you couldn't stand and be comfortable. I'm assuming they were on his posterior, so you couldn't sit and be comfortable. You couldn't lie down because they were on his back. You couldn't lie on your stomach. You couldn't do anything. You'd be completely miserable with boils. I've never had a boil, but I can just imagine how awful that must have been. Boils all over your flesh. He's lost his entire wealth. He's lost all of his children. And now he's covered in boils from his head to his feet. Just utterly miserable. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. Just days before this, Job was, and we read later on in the book, he was a a magistrate, a judge in the land. He's a powerful man. He was a good man, well-respected man, rich man. Now he's got nothing. He's covered in boils, sitting on a pile of ashes and scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery, a potsherd. You talk about going low. This is about as low as you can get. You're not going to get much lower than Job got. And if that's not bad enough, now listen to what his wife says. Then said his wife unto him, Doest thou still, or dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Before I get to that, though, he sat in a pile of ashes. And I just had this thought as I was putting this, putting my thoughts together on this one. You got several scriptures which talk about God giving us beauty for ashes. Job was in a pile of ashes, but the Lord would turn those ashes into beauty. Look at Isaiah 61 and verse 3. We'll get back to Job's wife in just a second. Isaiah 61 and verse 3. Just think if God would not have allowed all this stuff to happen to Job. Imagine the lessons that we would be missing out on. Millions and billions of Christians and Old Testament Jews derived comfort from the story of this book throughout thousands of years because of what this man had to suffer. So sometimes the reason you're suffering is so that others can be comforted by your sufferings and more importantly by the way you handle your sufferings. Others can derive strength from the way you handle your sufferings. And then you can comfort them with the comfort that you've been comforted with of God. We read about that in 2 Corinthians. But Isaiah 61 and verse 3, it says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And this is what will happen to Job by the end of this book. I'm not going to go through all 42 chapters, obviously. But he would get beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Look at Psalm 30 and verse 5. Psalm 30 and verse 5. It says, For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Always remember this verse. I give this verse to almost everybody who's suffering. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. It's not going to last forever. It may not actually be a literal morning. Maybe tomorrow morning you'll still be suffering. But 
relatively speaking, the pain that you're experiencing now won't last forever, and there will be a reprieve that will come, and it won't come that far away. So now we get back to Job's wife. So his wife, this is the only thing that Job has left is his wife. And she says to curse God and die. Now in the past, I've you know, kind of come down hard on Job's wife and you know, said not the nicest things about her. But if you think about it, think about what this poor woman has endured. She's endured everything that Job has except for the boils. But then she's got to endure seeing her husband in boils. She's lost all of the family's wealth. Where's her security now? She's lost her children. What are, the two, what are the two primary needs that a woman has? To be taken care of financially and her children. Those are two of the, the things that bring a woman the most joy and the most comfort. And she's lost all that. And now her husband's laying in a pile of ashes, scraping himself with a potsherd covered in boils. You know, we're told that the woman's the weaker vessel, right, in First Peter... Women are weaker vessels, 1 Peter 3. First Peter 3, in verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The wife is the weaker vessel, she doesn't hold up to things as well as a man does. That's just the way she's made. So, you know, for, for me or for any of us to get down on Job's wife and think, oh, what a carnal, worthless excuse for a Christian woman. Come on now. Would any of you do any better? Of course not. And I love what Stephen Polly said. He said that Job didn't loathe his wife. He led her. He didn't loathe her. He led her. Now, he does admonish her and give her a little bit of a rebuke because she was wrong. Verse 10, But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. He doesn't say you're a foolish woman, but he says you're talking like the foolish women. You're not speaking wisely right now. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. It's hard, you know, when, you, when you're going through something and then the person that you're closest with that you hope will help you through it, when they give up and they say, just curse God and die, then it'd be pretty easy to say, you know what, I'm just, uh, I'm done. I can't, I can't, I just can't do this by myself. And yet, Job still led his wife, instructed her, helped her to get through this, and he still didn't sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard all of this, uh, heard of this evil that was come unto him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, for they had made an appointment to uh, had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. You know, when this happened to Job, it says that he rent his mantle, his mantle, he shaved his head, he's sitting in a pile of ashes covered in boils. When they came to see him, it says they knew him not. They didn't recognize the guy. This isn't the same elder in the land that we remember that was sitting in the judgment, sitting at the gate. They didn't even recognize him. And they sprinkled dust on their heads and rent their mantles. Verse 13, So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. A whole week they didn't say one word to him. Sometimes the best thing you can say to somebody that is suffering affliction grievously is nothing just to be there for them. Now, if you're at a distance, it's, if you say nothing, then you're not there for them. I mean, there's really nothing you can do. But if you're there for them, just go up and give them a hug. Just sit next to them. Just let them know you're there. 
Sometimes saying something can be worse than not saying something. Solomon tells us there's a time to keep silence. Look at Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 7. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 7. He says, A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. I love what Charles Bridges said about this text. I wrote it down, I wrote the quote down here in my Bible because it was so good. He says, A time of sorrow also must be mentioned as a time of restraint. Precious words are often wasted at this season. The time of silence is more soothing. We had better restrain our words till the waters have somewhat assuaged. A voluable comforter, meaning a comforter that talks a lot, a voluable comforter adds to the trouble he professes to heal. He is rather a sore than a balm. Great wisdom is required to know when, as well as what, to speak. That's some good advice, some good wisdom. You ever been something traumatic happens to you, death of a loved one or something, you get, maybe somebody gets cancer, somebody gets sick or whatever, and then some well-meaning person calls you up right close to the time of the event and they just want to talk because they don't know what else to do except to talk, right? Wise man speaks because he's got something to say, a fool because he's got to say something. And then they think that talking about their own similar problem that they had or one that they knew of will help you out. You know, when you guys, when that happened with your baby, the last thing in the world you needed was for me to say, oh, I had friends in Cincinnati and it happened and they were in the NICU and da 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 and I go on for 15 minutes about that. You don't care. They don't want to hear that stuff. That's the last thing you want to do. So try to restrain yourselves when that happens. I feel bad for people at a funeral and especially if it was something like, you know, a, a spouse dies younger than expected and suddenly and you're just shocked by it. And the poor widow there is up at the casket and people are walking by and every person's got to sit there and talk to you for five minutes and tell you how bad they feel and how they remember when their husband or their wife died and this and that. And the poor person's just got to be exhausted. I would just say the best thing you can do is just walk up and say two words, I'm sorry, and give them a hug and move on. So Job's friends sat there for a week and they didn't say a thing. So here's what I'm going to leave you with. I'm going to leave you with some steps of how to deal with hardship. This, and I've added some verses to these points, so it will still take a few more minutes. But this is from Stephen Pauley. This is what I learned from him. And I, I would encourage you to write these things down because these are good. Six steps on how to deal with hardship. Number one, worship God anyway. Remember, that's what Job did. Whenever he lost everything, it says he fell down And he worshipped God. So worship God anyway. Number two, talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. Fight the lies. This is good advice. Talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. Because if you listen to yourself, you're going to have all these fears, all these emotions. What if this? What if that? Don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. Talk wisdom to yourself. That's the beauty of being a human being and having a rational mind. You can actually have a conversation with yourself, within yourself. Let me just give you a few verses. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Getting through a time of hardship is all it's going to be your mental attitude. It's how you perceive things to be. And if you have a negative attitude, if you you let your, your emotions overrule and start to feed back all this negative stuff to you, you're not going to get through it. But if you maintain a positive attitude, you'll get through it. Proverbs 4 and verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You need to instruct your heart. Don't let your heart lead you, lead it. Proverbs 23:19. Proverbs 23:19. Hear thou my son and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. And th- there this is powerful because there have been for instance POWs in prison camps 
the ones that maintain a positive attitude and, and taught and talk to themselves, not listen to themselves, but talk to themselves and say, you're going to get out of here. You're going to make it. Statistically, they did make it. They lived. But the ones that lost hope, they died. And that's true. That's a fact. Guide your heart in the way. In Proverbs 28, 26. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Don't trust your heart. Lead it. Number three is get in the Bible and be admonished and encouraged by it. Turn to Psalm 19 and verse 11. Psalm 19 and verse 11. It's not always easy to get in the Bible, especially when you've got hardship going on in your life. Sometimes you just don't have the, just surely don't have the time to get into it. And then when you do have the time, you just don't feel like it. Sometimes you just don't feel like it. But you'll find that when you finally do force yourself and get in there and start reading it, you will reap much dividends from that. It will help you immensely. Psalm 19 and verse 11, it says, Moreover, talking about the scriptures, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. And look at Psalm 119 and verse 9. Psalm 119 and verse 9. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Number four. This is, this is good. He was talking about this in reference to he had lost a lot of church members over the last year or so. He, I don't know what was going on, but anyway, he had lost a lot of his ministry. And he says, focus on what's left, not on what's gone. Don't focus on what you've lost. Focus on what you still have left. That would go if you lost a bunch of people in a church split or whatever you've lost. Focus on what you've got left. Don't focus on what you've lost. Look at Philippians three thirteen through 15. Paul had lost a lot in his life, but he wasn't focusing on what he'd lost. He was focusing on moving forward. Philippians 3, 13 through 15. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have, to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. See, Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which are before, we press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Focus on what's left, not on what's gone. Number five, work. Keep working. Just keep on keeping on. Keep on doing whatever you have to do. Whether that's, like Austin and I were talking about, whether that's mowing the grass, whether that's going to work, whether that's cleaning up the house, whatever you've got to do, just keep working. Keep on keeping on. That'll keep your mind also off of your hardship, and that'll help you to, to be able to, to... It helps just to clear your mind of things. Sometimes it helps just to get out and take a walk. I find that when I'm doing my work, and it's hard for me to do that. I'm not, I don't like to take breaks. I don't, I don't know. It just seems like wasted time. But whenever I force myself, just in the evening, I could sit there and I could read something else, but just go out and take a walk and it helps. Because it just when you get out, of the, get out of whatever circumstance and situation you're in and it clears your mind, it helps. And number six is wait. Finish looking up. He doesn't mean stop looking up. He means finish your life looking up to God. Psalm 27, verse 14. For that matter, finish each day looking up. Like Wayne was telling us this morning, finish each day with prayer and wait on the Lord. 
Psalm 27 and verse 14. It says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Job waited on the Lord. And I got something to say about that right here at the end. We got one more verse for you. Psalm 37 and verse 34. Psalm 37 and verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Wait on the Lord, and he shall exalt thee. Now we know the story of Job. That's, what I, that's why I read James 5 this morning. When he says you've heard of the story of Job, or you've heard of the patience of Job, and you've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is gracious and pitiful and merciful. You see, Job had to wait until the last chapter to be blessed. Remember that. Job's blessing didn't come right away. Job's blessing came the whole way at the end of chapter 42. So sometimes God allows us to go through some really hard times, and the blessing comes at the end. The blessing comes whenever you've passed all the tests, you've made it through it all, just like Job did, and Job ended up learning the lesson that God needed him to learn. The thing was, Job was a perfect and an upright man, we're told, but if you remember, when you go through the book of Job, all of a sudden there is a little bit of pride in Job that had lying, that had laid dormant in him for a long time. And then Job eventually gets too big for his britches, and Job wants his day in court. Job wants to have it out with God and say, God, I got some beef with you. I want to have my day in court. I want to lay out and say, hey, I'm a perfect man. I'm an upright man. I fear God. I shoo evil. Why did this happen to me? And God says, oh, you want your day in court? Let me ask you a few questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I created this place? Can you pull Leviathan out of the sea with a hook? Can you do all these marvelous things that I've done? And Job ends the book of Job saying, I abhor myself. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. When Job finally learned the lesson that God had for him to learn, and that pride got rooted out of Job, then Job was blessed at the end. But it took a lot of breaking down to get Job to that point. So, so God ultimately had a purpose in allowing this to happen to Job, and it was to make him a better Christian at the end of his life. And then God gave back everything to Job that he took away, double, double. He got the same amount of kids, but he got double the stuff that he had before. So he would do him good in his latter end. So I hope that this helps you to be able to deal with hardship. Whenever you, if you forget, just read through the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2, and it will refresh your memory. Thank you for listening.